Welcome to another West Main Worship Bite. In this week's lesson, we're going to be discussing what it means to talk about a Christ-like God, a God who is more Christ-like. We began discussing how there's a tendency to lose sight of how the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. And since they are one, to speak of God as Christ-like is really a powerful way to start understanding God. And I'm going to submit to you in these lessons that understanding God as more Christ-like or as Christ-like really is the epitome. It's the, it's the most richest, most beautiful way that we can start describing God. And I also think it's a way in which we can maybe transform our relationship to God and how we communicate God to others. Because what does it really mean to say, I know God? You know, many times I watch television or read on social media or I look at what other people say about God and honestly, I sometimes think to myself, I, I, I don't know that God you're talking about. I, that doesn't sound like the God I'm familiar with or I don't want to be associated with the God that you're describing right now. Sometimes we have a very one-sided view of God. Some people only see God as judgmental and wrathful because that's what they've always heard. That's the only God they know. Or some only know God as just this God of tolerance and he holds no one accountable and there's no responsibility. And so you get sort of these, these extremes and, and everything in between. And so when we say, I know God, what exactly are we talking about? Because sometimes, let's be honest, there seems to be as many versions of God as there are people. And certainly there are many different versions people talk about in proclaiming the gospel. What does it mean to preach Christ? What is the gospel? Uh, you ask that question to different Christian groups, you'll get all kinds of different answers. And that's nothing really new. The Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 1 said this, I am astonished. You are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. Now that's some strong language from the Apostle Paul. He's saying, look, if, you, if we're proclaiming a gospel that's not the grace of Christ, if it's not a Christ-like gospel, then he says, I don't care if an angel from heaven comes down on the earth and is speaking it. They're to be condemned because they are literally trying to shield us or rob us of this Christ-like God. We want a, not just a Christ-like God, we want a Christ-like gospel. But again, what does that mean? It can be easily perverted. And if it was easily perverted in the first century, what about all these centuries since then? Certainly, there have probably been many more versions of the gospel and versions of our understanding of God. Not only in the, in the larger religious world is that true, we could even say that among our own family and friends, and sometimes I think I see different versions of God among our members at West Main. And quite honestly, if I'm really frank about this and transparent, I have had myself, within myself, different versions of God. I often laugh at myself because I think I am pretty sure that my 20-something-year-old self would condemn my 50-something-year-old self today. I used to mock guys like me, things I believe today. I used to think, oh, pff, that what is that guy? He's, he's not preaching the truth. And here I am. I've become the very caricature of the person I judged in my 20s. And so, you know, having some different versions of God is all, can also be a part of just growth, right? Maturity. Sometimes... Maybe in life we need a God that is more moralistic, uh, more judgmental. We need a strict line to maybe help us change or repent. But then we need a God maybe sometimes in our life that is more merciful, more understanding, more forgiving, more patient. And God is all these things. And, and I suppose he's so much more that it's very difficult sometimes if we get locked into one version of God or one version of the gospel that our faith can be stilted. It can often be hurt because we've sort of put God into one box and it may even be a good box. You know, a God of mercy, a God of love, that's a good box. 
but he's so much more than that. So if you just keep him in that one box, then your relationship to God indeed will suffer. And so simply saying again, well, I just believe in the God of the Bible is really not gonna tell us much, right? Because everyone reads that Bible so differently and they may be very selective in what they read and they may be reading the Bible through their own cultural and historical prejudices. And so maybe you're reading the God of the Bible, but it's the God of the Bible as you read it, not necessarily the God that's actually been revealed in the pages of that Bible. And so often, I think people have mistaken the signs in Scripture for God himself. They're almost worshiping the Bible itself. Uh, sort of the, the, the Bible becomes idolatry, and that is a very frightening thing. And so throughout Christian history, Christians has, have wrestled with this. Who is God exactly? And they realized that no matter what image they came up with that was described in Scripture, there was so much more. And so there was this thing called negative theology that developed. It's the idea they would say, for example, uh, you might say God is Father, but then they would talk about how God is not a father. They may talk about how God is king, but then these Christians would talk about how he's not exactly a king. And you see this all through Scripture. Jesus is, for example, described as the Lamb of God. He's also described as the lion of Judah. So is he a lamb or is he a lion? And so he's both. And so people tend to get a little confused sometimes as they get locked into one image. And all these images and all these metaphors are designed to help us get at and start understanding who God is. So while we may never know God and never are going to know God fully and completely, there are many things about God that we can say for sure. Many things that we can speak about when we talk about God and who God is, but just always keep in mind that whatever you, whatever you say about God is never the end of the story. It's not complete. There's so much more to say. And sometimes these images can get perverted. I'm thinking of the account in Numbers 21 when God judged the Israelites with poisonous snakes, and then God had mercy on them. And remember, he tells Moses, I want you to fashion a, a bronze snake wrapped around a pole. And then everyone who would look upon that bronze snake would be healed. And so God's mercy and God's healing became symbolized by this bronze snake wrapped around a pole. And that symbol of healing is even used in some medical communities even to this day. But sadly, as we read later in scripture, that bronze snake became an object of idolatry under King Hezekiah. And so he was forced to destroy it. But Jesus later in the Gospel of John recaptures that image, redeems it. He says in John chapter 3, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So Jesus attaches himself to this image and says, that healing image that you read about in Numbers 21, that was just a small taste of what I am for all of humanity. All who would look to me will be healed. And so in Scripture, as we start looking at all these different images of God, we need to remember the phrase both and. Jesus is both and. He is both the Lamb of God and the Lion of Judah. It's not either or. So often we get into that sort of binary way of thinking, you know, God is either this or that. And, and then we lose sight of the larger images. Now, there is what we could call maybe a positive theology. There are things we could say about God for which there is no opposite, no negative. For example, God is good. He's never evil. He's always good. God is love. God is never hate. First John says, God is light, and in him, there is no darkness. God is perfect beauty. There is no ugliness in God. He is perfect truth. God is never a liar. God is perfect justice. God is never unjust or practices injustice. And beyond these characteristics of how we could describe God and, and think about God, there is also, let's be full here, more a little more rich, there is the experience of God. You know, there's the work of God. I think of Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. He says, For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. So we may not always have a, an image in our mind of who God is, 
but we can actually experience the work of the Holy Spirit in us. You know, God's energy, God's power is working within us, right? Paul said it, he works in you. So if God is literally working in you, then you can experience something of the nature of God literally in your life. But ultimately, when we talk about who God is, the way to speak of God is to say that God is Christ-like, that God is just like Jesus is. Jesus reveals who God is really like because Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, right? That's the incarnation. It means to be made flesh. And so often when we think, for example, of God becoming flesh, we might think of just of his birth. You know, God was born a human, but he was born a human and he fills humanity. He remains fully God, but also fully human. So this fully human being who is also fully God revealed the character of God to us. And so we must learn as we go through this series of studies what it means to speak of God as Christ-like. And what I'm really hoping for in this also is that we'll start rejecting the unchrist-like God. Because I believe, honestly, brothers and sisters, so many of us, and I certainly have done this myself, I have taught a very unchrist-like God. And I want to get back to what it means to describe God as Christ-like. And so when you think of, for example, just the Sermon on the Mount, what does it mean to say God is Christ-like? Well, God says, as a full human being in the flesh, as Jesus, he says, love your enemies. That's what it is to be a Christ-like God. Love your enemy. He says, if you want to be like me, then you need to pray for those who persecute you. He's the Prince of Peace. Now, how are we going to proclaim that God to people? You know, I want to say to all you Facebook warriors out there, all you out there posting, when you're posting on social media, when you're having your political arguments with people, what does it mean to say in that conversation, I'm going to love my enemy. I'm going to pray for those who persecute me. Because that's what it means to be Christ-like. I think so many people today are losing faith that they had, or many people won't become Christians, they won't have faith. Not because God is not beautiful, not because God is not attractive, but because they have been taught a version of God that quite frankly is odious, that is not Christ-like. In fact, I almost want to be with them and say, you know what, if, if that's your understanding of God, if that's the God you've heard preached to you, I don't want to believe in that God either. I'd rather be, in that sense, I'd be an atheist, right? Because the God you're proclaiming is so not like Christ that I don't know who that God is. That's a false God, and I want nothing to do with that God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who God has called, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. He preached Christ crucified. So again, in all this political unrest that we're experiencing, I want to say to all my brothers and sisters at West Main, what does it mean to take Christ crucified and translate that into politics? How are you going to do that? That question is not even remotely being asked, and yet it is the question. It's the question. What does it mean to proclaim Christ crucified? It's not just, quote, a religious, spiritual thing. Jesus was highly political, and how, what, what, what was his politics? I'm going to love my enemies. I'm going to pray for those who persecute me. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He didn't even speak a word as he was being crucified. But yet he kept loving, kept forgiving. What we see this radical Jesus who loves and forgives before people even repent, before they even deserve it. He is this manifestation you know, I, I, of love and, and understanding and mercy. I think of the woman at the well. He knew she was an adulteress, but he never even brings that up until she does herself. When he says, well, go back and, and bring your husband and we'll talk more. And she says, well, I, I don't have a husband. He says, well, you're telling the truth there. But he didn't bring it up in that whole conversation with her before. And even though she had all these twisted understandings of what the kingdom of God was and faith and all those things, he just lovingly preaches truth to her. He leads her to himself. Now, maybe that's a gift, but it's a gift we're all going to have to get. 
I just want us to learn somehow to preach that kind of Christ. And that's going to raise some tough questions, questions I wish we were asking more. For example, if, if God is in control, then why is there such chaos? If God is love, why is there so much hate? You know, if, if God loves us so much and he's the Prince of Peace, why does he seem so violent in Scripture? Many passages of violence. If God says he's love, then why does he say, if you don't believe in me, I'm going to torture you in hell forever? Some people believe that. So uh, what do we do with this God of love and this God who has been crucified? What does it mean again to preach a Christ-like God? So often, and I was taught this terribly, and I've taught it over the years, but I was taught this phrase, salvation by education. And basically, it, it was the idea that you cannot be taught wrong and saved right. And so if your view of baptism wasn't perfectly right, well, the argument would be like this. If you didn't understand it perfectly, then you did not obey Jesus' baptism. If you didn't obey Jesus' baptism, you're really not saved, you're going to hell. I taught that. To my shame, I have taught that. And that explains, by the way, why so many people in the Restoration Movement keep getting baptized over and over and over and over and over again, because they always learn something new about baptism. If it's salvation by education, we all flunked. We're all failing, all right? It's salvation by Jesus Christ, and that's it. And if you don't get that, you don't get anything. Now, I'm not saying, please don't start writing me, you don't have to come visit me and say, Terry, are you saying doctrine's not important? No, it's important, let's get it right, let's teach what's love, but if it comes down to perfect understanding, then I don't think anyone's gonna be saved because if you think you have that, then brother or sister, you have not read enough. You know, we need to get beyond this kind of self-righteousness. I have, I'm just gonna go off a little tangent here. I've seen so many posts lately about how, well, George Floyd wasn't a perfect man, and I, you know, I wouldn't like him, and he was no saint. Brother or sister, is that the Christ-like God we're preaching now? If we took all your thoughts that you've had over the years, and we transcribed them, and then we put them in the New York Times or on Facebook or social media, how are you going to come out? Every time, remember, you point that finger at someone, remember, there's four fingers pointing right back at you. So before we start condemning someone else, Perhaps we need to take a long, hard look in the mirror. And if you think, well, I'm not as bad as George Floyd was, maybe externally you weren't. But Jesus says he looks at the heart. And God is light, and if he shines that light in that heart, you might just discover you're not as perfect as you think you are. We don't need just a Christ-like more God. We need a Christ-like more church. So in the next several lessons, we're going to look at different versions of God that have kind of gotten away, like boulders that kind of, we can't really see this Christ-like God because we got some very faulty views of who God is. But I want us to at least begin having this conversation about what it means to say God is actually more Christ-like. And quite frankly, brothers and sisters, that's radical. I mean, Jesus, you know, when he started preaching about God as he is in the flesh, people were offended and they were shocked and, and then many were inspired and transformed. And so if we're preaching a christ we're preaching about a God who's not very Christ-like, I think we can know if we're not upsetting anybody. If they're not inspired to love more, if they say, what do you mean love your enemy? What kind of idiot are you? Well, I'm the kind of idiot that is God in the flesh because that's what our God said to do. He's radical. Now, I know people are going to say, well, how in the world do you do that? Well, you're going to have to look to the Gospels, aren't you? You're going to have to look at Jesus. And you'll say, yeah, but they crucified him. I kind of think that's the point. He died for the world. You see, the world wants to get into winning arguments and fighting with each other. But you, brother and sister, our God is more Christ-like, and as a church, we're going to strive to be more Christ-like. We have a beautiful Sunday.